Amen. Friends, I invite you to remain standing for the, uh, for the reading of our scripture lesson this morning. We are turning to the book of Acts to hear about the early church and how they began their works of discipleship as we continue in our all-in sermon series this morning, turning to discipleship. Beginning in chapter 2 with verse 37, hear now the word of the Lord. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you, for your children and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them saying, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed this, his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, let us go to God in an attitude of prayer. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing unto you. For you, O oh God, are this community's rock and redeemer. Amen. When Nathan and I, oh, just over 10 years ago, when we were first married, we just like so many other newlyweds, we had a whole collection of fun and brand new kitchen gadgets that I was so anxious to put to use. I decided that I wanted to, I was gonna, fo I was gonna feature one of the, the nine by nine beautiful baking dishes that I had received. And I was going to, in that baking dish, I was going to make my very first fruit cobbler from scratch. Now that may not sound like a very big deal to some of y'all, but uh, that was going to be my first time to make a cobbler from scratch because I'd always been very content with the frozen variety. But I sought out to make this cobbler and I decided I was even gonna invite company over. So we invited friends to come and to have dinner, but the, the spotlight was going to be on my cobbler. I went to the grocery store and I bought cherries, not canned cherries. But I was starting with fresh cherries. I followed the recipe very closely. And as it baked, it filled the house with this wonderful aroma. So I was so excited to bring it out after dinner. And I sat it on the table and began to serve my homemade from scratch cherry cobbler, of which I was very proud. And as I was serving it out, I would pull a piece and the rest of the cobbler would just move and ooze to replace it. I discovered that my cobbler was very watery, not gooey, but watery. It was runny and it wasn't holding up. And so as I literally like soup ladled it into the bowls, I found myself very surprised and really embarrassed. I offered lots of apologies to my guests and I wondered, where did I go wrong? So after they left, I went back to the recipe, which I had, which I had thought that I had followed very closely, but it turns out I left one very critical ingredient out of the recipe. Any bakers out there who know what critical ingredient I left out of my cobbler? Cornstarch, you're close. For me, it was baking powder. So nothing rose, <laughs> nothing, nothing congealed it real well. I left out a key ingredient and I was left with a flat, watered down cobbler. When I got started thinking about discipleship, I wondered how many of us 
have felt a bit flat. How many of us have felt in our life of faith that, that things just feel either watered down or like a key ingredient is missing? We feel flat because something's missing. You know, we're, we're checking off all these things. We're coming to worship. We're praying. Maybe we're even reading the Bible at home, but something's off. I've had these seasons in my life and have, have thought back, what was the common denominator when I felt like something was missing, when my faith felt flat or watered down? I realized in those moments, in those seasons, I wasn't engaged in any sort of discipleship opportunity outside of worship and things that I was doing on my own. I wasn't plugged into a small group of any sort. I wasn't studying the Bible with a group of people. I wasn't engaged in conversations with others outside of worship. Our adult discipleship opportunities, our participation in small groups, Bible studies, Sunday school classes, oftentimes this is that missing ingredient in our life of faith that leads us feeling like something's off, something is missing. Of course, our worship is critical to what we do because it's going to inform our entire lives. And mission is critical to who we are as Christians because in mission, we offer tangible expressions of God's love to our neighbors. But our worship and our mission are incomplete if they are not undergirded and supported by our own faithfulness and our own spiritual growth through discipleship opportunities. These opportunities include participating in a Sunday school class, joining a small group, taking part in a Bible study or a book study or book discussion. It can look like a, a pilgrimage to go somewhere and learn together. It can look like a retreat that you attend. These are opportunities where we learn together with other Christians, taking, um, getting head knowledge, gaining knowledge of God, information about God, but then in that communal work together, taking that information into transformation so that we're not just learning about God, but we are allowing our, trans our lives to be transformed by the information that we have about God. The early church, as we heard in our scripture passage, they based their life together on this principle of being in community with one another. Every year we hear the story from Acts 2, the, the Pentecost story when the Holy Spirit descended, was poured out upon the apostles and how it transformed their lives, how it brought, it, it created, it gave birth to the church. The Spirit as it was poured upon the disciples gave them the empowerment and the voices to be the voice in the hands and feet of Christ out into the world to continue the ministry which Jesus has started, the ministry into which he had called and sent the disciples. But we usually, when we read the story on Pentecost Sunday, we stop right before where we picked up today. And we hear, so what did their life together look like? What did they do next? How did they live together? Well, we hear in their story that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking bread together and to the prayers. Notice that the things to which they devoted themselves, there's this dual nature of them. There's learning and community. It didn't say the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them and they grew and grew and grew and then each of them went off to their own home to study the Bible alone, to pray alone, to study God's word by themselves. No, it talked about how they did this together, that they learned with one another and from one another. Their learning was not by accident and their community was not by accident. It required intentional efforts of all, intentional efforts of all to show up, to be a part of the learning. The intentional efforts to make that a priority, a defining characteristic of who they would be and who this church would be. And so as we gather here today, as the church seeking to be all in, 
We too were called to be all in with our learning in community, all in with our discipleship, all in to these communal opportunities or these opportunities that we have to learn in community, to learn with one another and from one another. And when we make this commitment to be a part of a discipleship opportunity, whether that be a Sunday school class, a Bible study, book study, or discussion, a retreat, a small group, a Sunday school class, whatever that opportunity is, a couple of really powerful things happen. And the first very powerful thing that happens is when we sign up for one of these opportunities, we are placing ourselves in an environment in which we can learn. We're placing ourselves in the perfect location for getting knowledge, information that can be turned into transformed living. We are placing ourselves in the, in the right place to be in holy conversations, to be challenged by one another, to offer challenges. I cannot help but think about my, my time spent in disciple Bible study. I've taught this, uh, this is my third year teaching disciple Bible study here in our church. And I love teaching this, I love teaching this Bible study. I love it because every year that I teach it, it requires me to reread important stories of, in scripture. It forces me to reread important parts of scripture so that I too can be reminded of the big story of God's work throughout history. But as I'm reading them, every time that I'm coming to scripture with a new class in a new season of my life, I'm coming at that scripture differently because I'm coming at that scripture perhaps with new life experiences of my own which have transpired from the previous year. I'm also coming at that scripture a little bit differently knowing that there's new and different people around the table that as I'm reading stories, new parts of a story are gonna stick out because I'm going to remember the folks who are around my table and think that is gonna make a difference in her life. I cannot wait to discuss that with him. And then, this happens for everyone else who, around the table. We all learn from one another. And I can tell you, I've taught this class. This is my third year here, but I've taught this class at least five or six times. And every time I have taught this class, I have learned something new. And it's not that I've just learned something new in my own study or preparation. I learned something new from the insights and the questions that folks who commit to being in this class bring with them each week. When we sign up for one of these opportunities, all of us, whether we are a participant or a facilitator, we are placing ourselves in the perfect environment to be challenged in our faith, to grow in our, our knowledge, our understanding of God so that we may be transformed by it. A second very important thing that happens when we commit to a discipleship opportunity is that when we commit to it, there are other folks who expect to see us there. Accountability is a huge part of our discipleship opportunities. I can't help now but think about several years ago, I set this lofty goal of running a half marathon. I'd never been a runner before, never had been particularly athletic, um, but I decided this seemed like a tangible goal. I'm gonna run a half marathon. So I kept that goal for about three years and every year I would begin and say, this is the year I'm gonna do it. And then as the year would end, I would remind myself, this was not the year for that. Maybe next year. I, was, I kept having this goal, but wasn't making any progress in it. So I, I tried to get a little more serious one year and I, would, I got to the, the, the three miles and then I was trying to figure out how to add miles to it. And then a lady, a friend of mine from church found out about this goal and she said, hey, I've run a half marathon. Why don't we start running together? And I said, well, okay, we'll give this a shot. Well, thanks to her help, I completed that first half marathon. And then we went on to be running buddies for the next four years. And something, the greatest, I, I, loved, um, I loved getting to visit with her multiple times a week. But the greatest thing that having a running buddy offered me was on accountability because I cannot tell you how many morning, mornings at zero dark 30, my running alarm would go off and I would squint at my phone praying, dear God, please let Nancy cancel. Looking to see if I already had a text from her that she couldn't run that morning. And when, when I didn't see a message from her, I thought, ugh, I gotta get out of bed because I can't disappoint Nancy. 
And I can't tell you how many runs began with this conversation out of one of our front doors. I really don't want to run today. The only reason I'm out is because I didn't want to disappoint you. We are both very um, strong, stubborn women. The accountability of knowing that Nancy was expecting me to be there got me out of bed so many mornings. And the same thing is true when we commit to a study with a group of people, the accountability, knowing that the person who sits next to us in that class is expecting us to be there. I've loved it watching in the disciple class, friendships take place or friendships spark, friendships perhaps between a person from the 11 o'clock worship service and the nine o'clock worship service. And then someone will say, hey, have you seen Phyllis today? And then Mary will say, I haven't seen Phyllis, but I'm going to give her a call this week. And I see her write that down. And then the next week, Phyllis is back in her spot. Because someone reached out and said to her, you matter and your presence matters. The, the accountability that we can offer one another in these groups helps us to see it through. So placing ourselves in this perfect environment and in the accountability of being a part of it. I love how Bishop Robert Schnazy, he wrote that popular book several years ago entitled The Five Fruitful Practices of, or The Five Practices of Fruitful Congregations. And he had this really great line that is, we all, we all want to want to study the Bible. All of us want to want to study the Bible. But what happens with our greatest wants, our greatest intentions, we end up getting overpowered by our own excuses, intimidations, feeling of being overwhelmed. That even though we want this, we fall out. We fall, we fall away from the commitments that we make. In a small group though, even though we have these we might find ourselves in that place where we're feeling intimidated, overwhelmed, or as if everyone else has it figured out and we're the only one with questions. In a small group, we can discover that other people are just as confused. <laughs> we may find out that we're not the only one who struggled with this topic, with this concept, with this story in the Bible. We've not, we're not the only ones who have ever been confused as to what this chapter meant or what this book was about. We find that we're not alone and we have the opportunity to learn with and from one another in those moments. So friends, as we're thinking about going all in and our, in our discipleship going all in, strong churches are made up of strong and faithful Christians. I read that simple line from another pastor this week that strong churches are made up of strong, faithful Christians. So we have to realize that none of us ever outgrow the call to learn. None of us are ever done learning more about God, learning more about our relationship with God. There's our our worship and our mission are not enough unless they're complemented by our discipleship and our growing deeper in our understanding and knowledge of God. And we all need a place to live that out, a community in which we can ask questions, where we can share and where we can gain support from folks who will come to know us well. As a church, we believe this so much that strong churches are made up of strong and faithful Christians and all of us need a small group where we can be held accountable and have a safe place to ask questions. We believe in this so much that when, that when we brought Pastor Annie, when Pastor Annie was appointed as our associate pastor, we, we transitioned the job description for our associate pastor so that half of her job responsibility is adult discipleship because we heard from so many in the congregation who said I am so proud of our children's ministry and the impact it's having in the lives of our young people I'm so proud of our youth ministry and the impact that it's having on these young adults but I need something I need some I need more opportunities to grow in my discipleship so friends as a church we have already invested in our discipleship knowing that strong churches are made up of strong and faithful Christians so how can, we, how can we go all in? How can we go all in for our discipleship? If we know that 
or what would our, I want you to imagine with me like we've done each Sunday, what would it look like for our, our discipleship if more of us were all in? What would it look like if there were more people participating in the discipleship opportunities that we have? What would it look like if there were, if there were, if there was more money to go towards this, if there were more people who were committed to leading or facilitating? What would it look like if, if there were more prayers devoted to the discipleship opportunities that we have in our class? What would it look like if more of us were all in for discipleship? How can you be all in for the discipleship ministries of our church? I invite you to take out of your bulletin that response card that we've, we've been lifting those up each week for the, the critical ministry area that we're highlighting each Sunday. So what would it look like if you were all in for discipleship? We challenge you to find ways that you can go all in and to let us know with, through this response card. So I want, before the end of the worship service, I want for you to fill this out, complete it. There'll be representatives from our stewardship committee at our exits with, who'll be receiving these so we can bring together the results to see that not only are we committing our financial resources, but we are committing ourselves to these critical ministries of our church. So what would it look like for you to go all in? That along with your financial support, could you commit to pray for our church's discipleship opportunities? Would you commit to participating in a small group opportunity or a discipleship opportunity, whether that be a Sunday school, a Bible study, a book conversation? Would you be willing to facilitate or lead one of those opportunities so that we have more that we are able to offer others and allow them to hear different voices from that position? Are you interested in attending a, a pilgrimage to the Holy Land? Our church hasn't done this in quite a while, and we'd love to know who's interested in an opportunity like that. Would you be willing to serve on Awesome Jay? Well, mark it. What about attending uh, or serving on an adult discipleship advisory board so that Pastor Annie knows what are, what are the itches amongst us? What are the topics that we're wanting to discuss? Where are the places where we are looking to go and grow deeper? So friends, fill this out. And if you want us to, to contact you, put your name on it so that we'll be able to reach out to you. But fill this out and then share it with one of our representatives at the end of our worship service. Friends, this matters. Our worship matters, our mission matters, and our adult discipleship, and our discipleship matters, and our discipleship matters because strong churches are made up of strong and faithful Christians. We want our church to be a strong witness for Jesus Christ in this world. And so we must do that, that intentional communal work of gaining knowledge so that our hearts may be transformed by that knowledge. So let's continue to be a strong church. Let's be a stronger church. Let's go all in. Amen.